Hello everybody and welcome to another lecture of 6837. Today we're going to continue our discussion of rendering by considering a particularly important and central topic in the computer graphics world and that's anti-aliasing. Now anti-aliasing is one of these fundamental problems and also one where the theory is somehow much more difficult than the practical techniques that we use. So you're going to have to bear with me today as we try and introduce this challenging topic in just one lecture of 6837. The reality is that really you should be taking an entire signal processing course to understand the ins and outs. Instead, today we're going to try and motivate some of the theory behind anti-aliasing basically pictorially rather than using heavy-duty calculus, although a little bit of calculus will appear just to help give you guys some intuition for what the problem is and how we go about resolving it. So to motivate why we need to think about anti-aliasing, it's important to maybe realize that our lectures so far have swept a number of related artifacts under the rug. So for instance, um, if you guys have started working on your ray tracing assignments, you've probably noticed that you have some really strange artifacts in the image that you produce right on the edges between different objects in your rendered scene. So for example, in these regions between the balls and the background, if you were to zoom in really close, what you'd see are these staircasing artifacts uh, right where the blue of the ball, for example, is transitioning to the black and white of the checkered floor. Now, the reason for this is pretty clear. Uh, remember that in our ray tracer so far, we have this big grid of pixels, and we're sending one ray right through the middle to determine the color of the pixel. So for instance, if the blue ball goes something like this, then notice that this entire pixel will get shaded blue, and its two neighbors will get shaded like the background, creating that stair-step artifact. But this sampling issue is not unique to this one example. Um, in fact, sampling issues have appeared in all kinds of different lectures that we've had in 6837. So as a second example, remember when we talked about texture minification, that is when you have a big texture image and you want to render it onto a small object in your scene, that you can run into some trouble, right? In this case, the texture contains some high frequency information like if you look in this image of the hand, um, there's all these different wrinkles, but the points where we sample pixel values are kind of far apart. And so what you end up seeing in this minified image here is basically just noise. So there's some kind of a sampling challenge going on here. Indeed, sampling challenges are all over the computer graphics universe. Another one, if you've ever played with uh, old versions of Microsoft Paint, uh, is this artifact called the Jaggies. So if you're playing with software for drawing a two-dimensional uh, object, like this line here, then uh, there are different algorithms that rasterize this line. That is to figure out which pixels light up um, to approximate this line, even though we're on a big grid of pixels on our screen. And as you can see, I mean, at the end of the day, this line doesn't really look like a line. It looks like, you know, something that keeps moving, you know, down and to the right. And the reason for that is that we're trying to render this sharp drop off between the blue line and the white background, even though we have a finite grid of pixels. In fact, these sampling issues don't even just appear when we produce images. They also appear when we uh, actually measure and, and, and take images into the computer using photographic equipment. So for example, um, many of you may have noticed a really bizarre thing that can happen when you take pictures of brick walls and other uh, patterns that repeat themselves at a pretty high frequency along an image, which is that you get this really strange artifact, which is low frequency. So for example, here is admittedly a pretty compressed photograph of a brick wall. <laughs> One thing that helps us these days is that our cameras are just really high quality. Uh, and if you look at this image long enough, you'll notice that there is a particular artifact kind of going like this, which is this low frequency visual signal that you certainly wouldn't expect to see in real life if you looked at a brick wall. I don't think that this pattern is due to some strange physical artifact on the bricks, uh, but rather it had something to do with how we took our photo. Uh, this artifact sometimes is called ringing, although it has many different names depending on what universe you're in. Now, these are all sampling artifacts due to producing and measuring images. 
But in fact, even if we think about animation, sampling artifacts can appear in that universe as well. So as one example, take a look at one artifact that you may have seen uh, when you're watching car commercials on TV. So oftentimes when you're filming cars, cars are great examples of objects that move pretty quickly. <laughs> and in particular, uh, the wheels of cars spin at a very fast rate. And here's one thing that can happen, which is that when you film car wheels, you know, probably this car wheel is only moving in one direction, but suddenly it looks like it can turn direction, change velocity, and so on. And this is a pretty common artifact, um, sometimes known as the wagon wheel effect. So why do you think this happens? Well, it's actually a sampling artifact. So in particular, let's stop this. Uh, Let's say that your car uh, has wheels that rotate, you know, at some rate, you know, like 60 times a second or something. And meanwhile, your camera takes photographs at some other rate, like 50 times a second. Then what's going to happen? Well, every time you take a new image of the car wheel, it's going to rotate. But let's say that your camera really severely undersamples. So like your Wheels rotate at 60 times a second, and your camera only takes one image every half a second or something like that. Well, then you could be in this scenario where, let's say, your car wheel has some marker, like a spoke that points upward. So as the wheel rotates, this little line kind of rotates like a clock face. Then it could be that here's the first image that you take of your wheel. Then the wheel turns almost, even though it's turning forward, it turns like maybe 350 degrees. So the next time that you image it, it's all the way over here. Now, in reality, what happened is that your wheel rotated so much that the, you know, the spoke ended up all the way backward. But when you take the photo, what is the effect? Well, the effect, if you uh, at least sort of the simplest possible explanation, is that your wheel was actually rotating in the opposite direction. So this wagon wheel effect is the... Uh, sort of plague that hits a lot of car commercials and action scenes and movies. And it just has to do with the relative rate between the shutter of your camera and the rate at which your uh, wheels spin on your car. So in each one of these examples, you might ask a simple question, which is what's broken? And not to get too philosophical on you, but in some sense, what's broken is the interface between the real world and the digital. In particular, the real world in front of us, you know, barring quantum physics or whatever crazy stuff is happening at a micro scale, is sort of continuous in nature, right? I can query any point x comma y and ask what is the color at that point? Now, what are we trying to do in tasks like rendering? Well, we're trying to take this continuous world and put some grid on top of it with the constraint that in every grid cell, we can choose at most one color. And discrete sensors, for example, your camera sensor, discrete displays, for example, uh, the uh, computer screen in front of you, all force you to make this funny decision, which is to take a continuous world and summarize it in a finite number of bits. And that's somehow what goes wrong. In fact, these aliasing artifacts aren't always unique just to camera equipment, although they certainly are exaggerated there. In fact, your eye also has a finite number of sensors inside of it, like rods and cones. We'll talk more about that later in this course. Uh, and sometimes uh, these artifacts are actually due to just the anatomy of your eye rather than anything else. So here's a more succinct way to describe what's broken. Let's say that I'm trying to render a five by five image of this very complicated scene the question that I should ask each of you guys is if we continue in our course's analogy of thinking of rendering like holding a screen door in front of my eye and filling in the color of each pixel, what color should be in each pixel of this image? Like for example, these, uh, this pixel in the upper left, it contains black, white, yellow, red, and we have to summarize all of these different colors with one single RGB. And 
So what can happen and what causes these aliasing artifacts is the fact that we're undersampling the real world. And if we don't do this in a really careful way, we can end up with some undesirable low and high frequency effects. So here's going to be our strategy for today. We're going to use mathematical and perceptual tricks to compensate for sampling. Now, in particular, sampling problems often are known as aliasing. Um, another word for, uh, you know, alias is ghost. So you're sort of seeing these ghost things like the moray artifacts in that photograph of the brick wall. And there's only so much we can do to combat this. I mean, in some sense, at the end of the day, we're forced to work with this finite pixel grid and we simply can't capture the whole real world. So what we're going to do is try and get the best approximation possible of the real world on our finite uh, grid. That's what we'll be able to do with the mathematical side of our story. And then we're going to try and understand a little bit about what your eye sees and what your eye doesn't see in order to figure out what detail we really do need to capture in that grid and what information we can throw away. And so this is a pretty typical story in the computer graphics universe. We have one foot in mathematics and algorithms and computer science trying to build efficient techniques that produce as realistic displays as possible. But then we have another foot in human perception to understand if we only have so much computational time and we only have so many pixels in a grid, what parts of a scene are going to be the most important for your eye to see uh, in order to get a realistic result in your graphics system? So there are samples of aliasing all over the place in graphics. Here's another illustration of basically the same effect we've already talked about. So here we're trying to render an image of a fruit bolt. We superpose our uh, pixel grid on top of it and now um, when we create our final fruit bowl image, we do so by just selecting the center of every pixel as the color, and this is the result. Obviously, this isn't a particularly good reconstruction. Um, but this is going to lead us to the theory that we'll discuss uh, today, which is something called sampling and reconstruction. The idea here being that there's some smooth picture that you're trying to capture, but you have your finite pixel grid you sense the values at some finite set of points. So these one dimensional plots are just like the information in your image along this one line. And what do you get? Well, the information you get is just the color of the image in the places where you sent out rays uh, during your ray tracing algorithm. And now the reconstruction procedure is kind of like turning on pixels based on the colors that you measured. And so, for example, here is the reconstructed image given the sampled data. And our goal, of course, is to make the sampled data and the original image, or rather the reconstructed data and the original image look as close as possible. With the restriction, the, the reconstruction has to operate within the boundaries of our display technology. So here, lighting up pixels as rectangles. And so, if we don't handle this correctly, we can have artifacts like jagged boundaries, right? These jaggies that we've referred to a number of times already. But we can also end up with really unfortunate artifacts that can really affect the way that we see a scene. So here's kind of an evil scene uh, to render. So here we've got a bunch of little triangles. And notice what goes on. This scene is pretty much left, right, symmetric up to the shift between these two triangles here. But because of the way the scene is laid out, what happens? Well, if you focus on this pixel right here, notice that the center of this pixel is ever so slightly above the yellow triangle. So the entire pixel turns black when you render it. Now, this rendered uh, black pixel is essentially shading in this entire region, even though the reality is that a very large piece of that region is actually yellow in the original image. Uh, now, in this particular case, notice that this made for a really poor image uh, for a lot of different reasons. I mean, the original input was symmetric. The output looks basically random. Now, aliasing also appears uh, due to foreshortening and perspective effects. So, for instance, this checkerboard looks okay when it's close to the camera because the checkers are kind of big. But then, as the checkers move farther away from your camera, in effect, they get smaller, and that's where you start to see these moray patterns, which is just the same thing as what we we're seeing in the photograph of the brick wall. Now, here's the thing. These weird patterns 
from a Fourier perspective, we're going to see that they're sort of inevitable. But from a rendering perspective, this is really, really, really bad because it's not even just the your computer screen isn't dense enough to resolve the detail in this area of the scene. That's certainly true, regardless of what color you put there. But the fact that your eye actually perceives an interesting pattern which shouldn't be on the image is the really unfortunate artifact because your eye is drawn to this interesting thing, which in reality isn't what you intended to render. And of course, this effect shows up in photographs too. So um, these days, probably your even your iPhone camera does a relatively good job capturing detailed scenes. So you'd be hard pressed to find a uh, patterned enough object to get this uh, effect. But one place where you might see it is when you look at the thumbnails of the photographs that you take, where they're like scaled down so you can see a bunch of them all at once. So for example, here we have a photograph of a building, and when it was uh, down resed for the thumbnail, you can see this crazy moray pattern showed up here. So this is some kind of a philosophical problem. The physical world is continuous, but software and displays and sensors are all discrete. So if I'm allowed to wax poetic for a second, in some sense, graphics is a really unique universe because it's all about translating these continuous problems into discrete ones. And this is something we've done over and over and over again in this course. For example, when we solved ordinary differential equations for physically based animation, we had to discretize time um, in global illumination and uh, rendering and so on. We're going to have these different sampling techniques. Uh, we use meshes, which are essentially discrete approximations of smooth surfaces. And in all of these cases, getting a really careful mathematical understanding is going to be really critical to understanding what's going on. Now, to get started with our discussion here, another thing that we often philosophize about in computer graphics is exactly what a pixel is. Now, the reality is that we all use this term informally, and probably if you speak with different engineers in different areas, for example, people that make displays or make uh, cameras as opposed to people that are doing signal processing and computational photography, we all have a slightly different idea of exactly what a pixel is. But one of the sort of agreed upon philosophies that I think many people in graphics use is that a pixel is not a box, it's not a disk, or like a tiny light bulb. Um, and the reason that I say that is, of course, if I send the same JPEG image to 10 different displays, they all might display it in a slightly different way, right? If I put it on the uh, Microsoft Surface that I have in front of me, um, then I'll be using an LCD screen. I could also send it to uh, my favorite football stadium with one of those giant displays with light bulbs, and then um, suddenly your pixels probably would have some space in between them. So. In most of the theoretical models that try to predict and explain aliasing artifacts and tell you how you could get rid of them, rather than thinking of a pixel as a box or a tiny light, we think of a pixel as this more abstract object. We think of it as a sample. In particular, what that means is it's one measurement or one expression of a value of a function at just one location. It's kind of similar to that picture that we were looking at uh, before of the bowl of grapes. You know, the pixel here is just the value of this image at these little yellow points. And so we're not going to try and accompany that with a particular display technology. So because of this, there's some things that are corollaries that we can keep in mind. A pixel doesn't have a dimension or an area. It can't be seen. That This, this one is a little bit tricky to think about. But we're going to think of a display technology as taking this pixel value and then doing something to it to put it on a finite area to display it. But it does have a coordinate and it has a value. So this procedure of generating pixel values is sometimes called sampling. And this is the idea of mapping a continuous function to a discrete one. That is, you have a function, uh, for example, f of x, and now we're only going to get to know the values of f of x at some finite set of values x rather than every possible one. Now, it's important to distinguish sampling from a different discretization artifact that also appears in graphics, but is a little bit less important and one that we're not going to focus on today. And that's quantization, 
Now, in quantization, we're mapping continuous variables to discrete ones. Now, these definitions sound almost the same. So let me show you an image that hopefully will help you understand the difference. So here's some continuous function f of x, right? So at every different x value, you have a different y value, which is the value of f of x at that point x. So in the sampling procedure, which is what we're going to focus on today, what we'll do is we'll choose a finite set of x values. And at each of these x values, we're going to measure the value f of x of our function. You can think of that as kind of like the height over a point. What does that mean? That means that we don't get to know the value of our function f of x everywhere. We only get to know it at this finite set of x values. So as an example, if you think about the ray tracing algorithm, every time we send out a ray from our camera into the real world and ask for its color, that's kind of like gathering one more sample of uh, this continuous, but well, not necessarily continuous, but very complicated function, which is the color uh, at a single point x comma y. Now, to distinguish sampling from quantization, if you take a numerical analysis course, you will focus quite a bit on quantization. So quantization has to do with the vertical axis here. And the idea is that after I measure my sample, I have to store it on the computer, right? I have to store it in like a double or a floating point value or something like that. Now, what does that mean? That means that I only have a finite number of digits to work with in my RG and B values. And so I have to do a little bit of rounding. So again, quantization has to do with taking the value of f of x and rounding it to, for example, the closest double precision. Whereas sampling has to do with the set of x's at which you know the value of f of x. Now, typically, sampling is the key consideration that really, really matters when we're talking about aliasing and different imaging artifacts. So that's going to be our focus for today. That's not to say that quantization isn't important. So, for example, in HDR photography, so high dynamic range, quantization become, can become a real problem, right? So in HDR photography, I take an image of like a very bright window in a very dark room. Then there's this huge range of possible pixel colors. And maybe you're really testing the limits of your number crunching system, um, your number storage system rather, uh, by, by imaging this particular scene. So we'll return to that a little bit later when we talk about imaging. But for now, we're going to assume that we can store basically infinite precision, like we can store floating points with as many digits as we want, but we can only take a finite number of them into our computer. That's a very typical model. So the basic story that we're going to try and fill in today is one that you've actually already probably implemented if you started thinking about writing a ray tracer. So the story looks something like this. The visible light just out there in the universe, we're going to think of as some continuous function. Now that I think about it, actually, this word continuous is a little bit fishy, but certainly it's a, a function of a real valued variable. I can sample it anywhere. But because I'm on a computer, I can't store this function at every single point in the universe. I have to sample it. So that's the first thing that I do. And depending on what graphics application I'm in, I can sample in a different fashion. So for example, if I'm in photography, then I take a digital camera out into the physical world, I click the button, and then what comes back is a grid of pixel values, which are where my sensors are inside of the camera. Or in a ray tracer, like we've been talking about the last few weeks, I can sample it by sending rays through different pixels. And in either case, what I get is a finite set of information. So. This is the first thing that I do. And notice that once I sample this, I forget the rest. There's a key, ah, there's a key step here that I sort of haven't written down, which is that I forget the continuous function. <laughs> so originally there was this continuous universe of colors in front of my eye. I sample it and now the only information I have at my disposal is what I measured. I throw everything else away. Now in a second step, well, I have a piece of display technology. I want to reconstruct the continuous function that I just sampled. 
So how can I do that? I can do that, for example, by turning on and off pixels on my computer screen in response to the samples that I gathered from my camera. What we're going to see today is that both of these steps can create problems in artifacts. Uh, sometimes these are called pre-aliasing and post-aliasing. I wouldn't get too hung up on these two terms. Um, but essentially, one of them are bugs in your image that are caused by, for example, undersampling. And the other is bugs in your image caused by reconstruction and display in a poor fashion. So the main issue and the thing that we want to kind of overcome, but in some sense we can't, uh, is the challenge of undersampling. Now, the basic issue is that oftentimes we have these super high frequency details that we'd love to capture in our rendered image, but our pixels are just too far apart to sample this kind of thing. And in the worst case, what you can end up with is some really strange artifacts. So for example, on the left here, what we see is a very high frequency function like sine or cosine wiggling up and down, but we've sampled it at a low rate. So we would call this uh, grid undersampled. So take a look. The red values are the samples that we obtain when we carry out our sampling procedure. And one thing that you might notice is that actually if you undersample a high frequency function, the simplest explanation for the samples that you gathered might actually be a low frequency function. And this phenomenon known as aliasing is exactly like that moray pattern that we saw on the side of the brick building. Now, I think this lecture ends up being pretty close to Halloween, and uh, that's perfect because, of course, essentially what ends up happening when you undersample is that when you render, you see some weird alias or ghost of the original high-frequency signal that you wanted to display. It's all very spooky, this theory. So what's the solution here? What do we do to essentially try to approximate or display high-frequency patterns when our computer screen only has so much, you know, so many pixels. Well, we don't have too many options, but essentially the big takeaway from today's lecture is that your options are to oversample or blur things out. That essentially maybe, for example, undersampling a, a checkerboard and getting a random pattern of black and white pixels is less preferable to blurring and just getting one gray region. And sure, neither one of those is a checkerboard, but at least we're not seeing these, high, these low frequency artifacts that are appearing by accident. And indeed, that's basically the trick in all kinds of different areas. Um, so in audio processing, you can have sampling artifacts and uh, some people will apply low pass filters to kind of get rid of some of the, uh, the noise that will appear otherwise. Uh, in ray tracing and rasterization, we'll see that multiple rays per pixel can really help. Uh, and in textures, uh, we'll use an analogous technique by uh, creating mip maps and similar structures. Now, if we want to add detail of this to this story, what you really need, unfortunately for all of you, is some pretty serious math. This is very serious. And um, Really, the sophistication needed to understand this is more than we can squeeze into one lecture. But unfortunately for you guys, your instructor does happen to be uh, uh, on the mathematical side. So we're going to attempt to give a little bit of a pictorial version of the sampling and reconstruction story, just so that you guys have some intuition for what electrical engineers are talking about when they talk about anti-aliasing and related techniques. So let's get started with that. Before we do, so you can see here's our, uh, you know, beginning uh, math tag here. Um, I should warn you guys that this is the opposite of a rigorous lecture. Um, sadly, as much as I would love to go to the blackboard and derive all of the equations that are necessary, A, we don't have time, and B, I don't have a blackboard. <laughs> um, so today we're going to do the best that we can to give you some idea of what's going on. So feel free to ask lots of questions as this is happening uh, and post even more on Piazza after the lecture is over. So here's going to be our basic model. Rather than talking about images, which are just two-dimensional functions like f of x comma y, just for simplicity today, we're going to talk about one-dimensional signals, which are just y equals f of x. It turns out that basically the same considerations apply in 2D. There's just a little more notation.
So this is our model, is that we have some function y equals f of x, and x is our uh, continuous variable, right? Meaning that we can essentially sample any x value and get a y value out. So now let's see if we can tell our whole sampling and reconstruction story in a slightly more mathematical fashion. So the first thing that we're going to do to our function f of x, remember here's x, here's f of x, is sample it. That is, we need to go out into the world and take some measurements of the function f of x at a finite, discrete set of points. So what can we do? You know, maybe we choose some points along the uh, uh, x-axis here. And we're just going to measure the y value at these different places. And this is going to be our analog of ray tracing, right? So each one of these x values that we've chosen is like sending out a ray, and then when we measure the f of x value, what we get back is the color at that location in our sort of continuum image. Through the magic of PowerPoint, here's a nicer uh, version of what this looks like. Mathematically, we can think of this, uh, so if the green function here is f of x, we can think of these little arrows that I've drawn as f of x times some impulse train function of x, which you can think of as a function that's just zero in all the spaces in between the samples, and then one, or technically it's a delta function, if you're familiar with that language, at the sampling locations. So in other words, what happens when we sample is we throw away that green curve and all we're left with are the heights of these red arrows, right? We sent out a finite set of rays during our ray tracing procedure, and these are the colors that came back. Now, what's the basic challenge here? Well, we have no idea what's going on between these samples, right? It could be that, you know, our function is extremely complicated in between each one of these things, but this is the information we chose to measure, so this is the information we have. So that's our sampling procedure. What comes next? Well, the next thing we have to do is reconstruct. Now, the input to our reconstruction procedure is not that green function. We don't get to go out and measure more samples. But rather, it's just these red samples and our display technology, which maybe in an ideal world, we can choose any way we want. We can manipulate these red values in any fashion possible to reconstruct what we hope is a good approximation of that green function we had before. So probably we'd end up with something like this purple function here, right? The purple function interpolates the data that we have, is relatively smooth in between the data points, and life seems good. So again, what was our procedure? We started with a green function. We sampled it, threw away the original green function, right? Because we gathered our samples. And now when we tried to display it on our screen, in effect, what we've done is filled in these isolated samples with a continuous thing. Now here's the big challenge. If we compare that to our original signal, we actually, we did okay, right? Like on the left and the right here, we have a pretty good approximation. But for instance, here, there was some bump that we just didn't capture with our sampling procedure. Another way to understand this is that high frequency information got lost during our reconstruction procedure. Now, this was a pretty mild example, but you know, maybe we take our samples to be even farther apart and uh, we sample an even more complicated wiggly function like what I'm showing you here. Well, what's going to happen when I reconstruct, you know, I'll probably get something like this purple curve, uh, which is nowhere close to the green function. So of course, four samples really didn't suffice here. Or in the worst possible example, you know, maybe my original signal is this red function here, which is perfectly periodic. My And then my reconstructed one based on the blue samples that I gathered is shown in the blue curve. And the reconstructed curve is probably somehow simpler than the red one, and it perfectly fits the data that I have, but it's not what I wanted. So hopefully you guys see the basic issue here, which is that if I have samples 
or rather I gather my samples and interesting stuff happens in between my samples, I simply can't reconstruct that information because I never saw it. Another way to put that is that there are just too many wiggles of my function between consecutive samples that I've gathered. So that's our intuition, and what we need is a way to formalize it. And luckily for us, you know, many hundred years ago, uh, back in, I believe, the 19th or late 18th century, there's a gentleman by the name of Joseph Fourier who came up with a really revolutionary idea. In fact, quite a few. Fourier is kind of an interesting guy. You know, there are relatively few mathematicians out there that had interesting lives, but Fourier is uh, among them. I think the other one is Galois, right? I think Galois was in a duel, but I digress. So Fourier uh, invented the Fourier series and the Fourier transform. And the theorem, or the theorem-ish like uh, object, the way that I'm stating it on the uh, screen today, is that most functions can be written as combinations of sines and cosines. That is to say that I can take any function you know, uh, x, f of x here, whatever it is, and I can write it as some linear combination of things that look like cosine of ax and sine of ax. This object is known as the Fourier series, or the Fourier transform, depending on whether my uh, domain for my function is finite or infinite. So, if you take a signal processing course, you'll spend a huge amount of time talking about Fourier analysis, and I uh, get to essentially explain it to you all pictorially today. But here is the basic uh, idea of the Fourier uh, transform. So on the one hand, my function f of x, this is this green function that we're following around today, you can think of it as in the spatial domain. What does that mean? Well, this variable x here is a spatial variable, um, meaning that it essentially represents a location. Now the Fourier transform takes functions and maps them to new functions. That's this big F sing symbol here. And these new functions are a function of frequency. Frequency is this input variable xi that you see here. Okay, so essentially, what the Fourier transform of a function f of x is saying is that if I construct a particular function sine of xi x, the question is how much of this oscillatory function exists inside of f of x? We're going to talk a little bit more about exactly how that's measured in just a few minutes here. So the thing to notice for now is as xi gets bigger, Sine of a or sine of, of xi x wiggles faster as a function of x, right? The bigger xi is, the faster this function oscillates. So the way I can understand the Fourier transform is to say that at different values of xi, we can understand different scales of what's going on in my function f of x. So for example, what do we see? We see that f has some low frequency fun uh, content. So there's some part of f that changes pretty slowly along the image. There's also maybe some high frequency wiggling going on in F, most likely caused by maybe that little artifact there. So to get a better feel for how the Fourier transform works, let's actually look at some two-dimensional uh, examples. So here's a pretty typical visualization. This is a photograph on the left-hand side. I shamelessly have borrowed it from another graphics course at Stanford. This is a very famous graphics researcher by the name of Pat Hanrahan. So here, we see Pat in the spatial domain. And on the right-hand side, we see Pat in the frequency domain. So the origin here is going to be uh, the, uh, the zero frequency. And as I move out, I can think of this as the frequency in X and the frequency in Y. So here, because we're in two-dimensional world, we have xi1 and xi2, and we can think of the amount of white here as telling you how much of this function, like this photograph, uh, has a component that looks like the function that's kind of like cosine, oops, cosine of xi uh, 
one x plus xi to y. So this is just to say that it could be low frequency in x and high frequency in y or vice versa. Again, the details here don't matter a ton, but we're gonna do a few experiments where we take Pat, we take his Fourier transform, we edit it somehow, and then we invert the Fourier transform and see what happens to the original image. So here's an example. So here I took the original Fourier transform and I just zeroed out all the values close to zero. So remember what that means. That means that I've removed the low frequency information, like the stuff that changes slowly along the image, and just left behind the high frequency information. So if we take a look at Pat, notice that essentially what's left over are the sharp edges in the image, which makes sense because those are extremely high frequency changes. Conversely, if I erase everything except the inner part of the Fourier transform, this is sometimes known as a low pass filter because you're essentially keeping the low frequencies and throwing away the high ones. Then what do I end up with? I end up with a blurred out version of Pat. And the reason is that all the high frequency things like edges have been erased. Now, if you want to see some really funky stuff, uh, you could do something like a band pass filter, which just keeps frequencies in a particular interval, right? So big frequencies are gone and small frequencies are gone as well. And now you can see that there's somehow a spatial scale that is preferred by this frequency, which isn't too small or too big. I would say this third image is not super informative, but the first two are. That notice when I keep only high frequencies, I see lots of very sharp wiggly stuff. When I keep only low frequencies, I just see a blurred out version of my image. Okay, so let's talk about the math of the Fourier transform a little bit. So here's our function f of x. This is the one that we keep considering. And essentially, remember that our Fourier transform is trying to measure how much f has in common with another function of x, which has frequency xi. Incidentally, I'm noticing in my slides now that I've been a little bit sloppy about constants like 2 pi. That doesn't matter a ton, especially in today's lecture, since we're not doing any calculations. Um, the thing to notice is just that this increases with xi. So how do we measure when two thing, how much two things have together? Well, how we can measure how much two vectors have in common is by taking their dot product, right? So for example, if I have V and W, and they're nearly parallel with one another, then V dot W is gonna be pretty large. Uh, conversely, if V and W are basically perpendicular or orthogonal to one another, well, then their dot product V dot W is gonna be small, or at least close to zero. I'm not gonna worry about the absolute value here. So dot products are some very coarse way of measuring how much two things have in common, right? These two vectors on the left have a lot in common. These two vectors on the right have very little in common. So it turns out the Fourier transform uses exactly this brain dead measurement, but instead of doing it on vectors, it does that on functions. So remember that we have our function f of x we have this sort of canonical periodic thing, which is like sine of two pi xi. Xi is one of these Greek letters that nobody can actually write x. Notice that if xi gets bigger, uh, the uh, wave compresses here. So if I want to measure how much these two things have in common, I can just take their dot product. In particular, at every x value, I can multiply the values of these two functions, just like a dot product, and then sum them all together. But of course, now there's a lot of x values, so rather than multiplying sum, we take the integral. So here's the definition of the Fourier transform. I've written it in two different ways. Now, this is a little bit hard to parse, so let's see if we can read this right. Here's a way to understand this. f is a function in the spatial domain, right? This is really a function f of x. Now, the thing about the Fourier transform, it is a map that takes functions to other functions. <laughs> this is where things are a little confusing. So I would kind of parenthesize the expression this way. So this whole thing is some function of xi, 
So if you don't like this, you can think of it as G of Xi or something like that, and just call that the Fourier transform. And what is the definition? Well, essentially, all we're going to do is say, well, Xi is some fixed frequency. And we want to know how much of that frequency is hiding inside of F. So what do we do? We just take the dot product between F and that frequency. Now, there's a tiny detail here, which is that there are two different functions that can have the same frequency xi, and that's cosine and sine, right? whether you start at 0 or 1. So Fourier has just a sneaky mathematical sleight of hand. It's not actually particularly important for the theory, but you might as well know, um, which is to hide the cosine in the real part of the Fourier transform and the sine in the imaginary part. So if you just looked at the real part of the Fourier transform, it would be the dot product between the function f of x and the function cosine of 2 pi xi x. And if I look at just the imaginary part, then it would be the dot product of f of x and the function sine of 2 pi x xi. So the idea here is that the Fourier transform is a function of xi. For each value of xi, I get a different integral here. And just for some compact notation, if you remember, I think it's the Euler formula here. I was confused with the Euler characteristic. Um, the cosine plus i sine is the same as e to the i whatever. And so that's all that's going on in the Fourier transform. Again, I can't emphasize enough how brain dead the Fourier transform is. It's just saying like, okay, if I want to know how much f of x has in common with like cosine of 7x, then all I'm going to do is take the dot product between these two things. <laughs> That's it. Okay, so hopefully now you have some intuition for what the Fourier transform is doing. And now we can return to our sampling and reconstruction story. So rather than our complicated function f of x, let's actually try a simpler function f of x. So here uh, is this green thing, kind of looks like a bell curve. and this is in the uh, spatial domain at the top. And at the bottom, we're looking at the Fourier or the frequency domain. And so we have a function f of x. We have a new function. We can think of it like g of xi. Or if we want to be fancy pants about it, then we can think of it as the Fourier transform of f evaluated at xi. <laughs> and let's say that we sample this function f of x. So in other words, we gather the value of f of x at some evenly spaced points. I've obviously done a pretty poor job of evenly spacing in my drawing here. The question is, remember that when we sample, that's kind of like multiplying by an impulse train. So in other words, replacing f of x with some new function, which is like only measured at these values and then zero in between. So it's like one little blip and then nothing, and then another little blip and then nothing. The question is, what is the Fourier transform of that sampled object. Now I'm going to show it to you kind of like we did an experiment and then we're going to go back and explain what what had happened. So I'm going to sample my function f of x and here's the Fourier transform that I get. It's actually a function with a bunch of little bumps in it that kind of look like I told my took my old Fourier transform which is down here and I just repeated it a bunch of times and summed them all together. So let's say I did that experiment in MATLAB and I'm trying to understand like, well, what the heck? Why do I see this weird repeated pattern when I sample my function f of x? One thing I might do to get a better understanding is see what happens when I add more samples. So I take these red arrows and I gather them closer together. Let's do that. Now what we'll see in our Fourier transform is that there's still a periodic pattern, but the pieces are farther apart. Now, what's going on here? Essentially, the intuition that you should have when you see these repeated things here, remember this is like low frequency, which makes sense because our original function f of x, this is a very low frequency function, right? We can see that because it's not really wiggling particularly quickly. There's not like a whole lot of spatial variation. But then when we sampled it, somehow we introduced higher frequency information oops, than was there before. So the question of what's going on is an important one. And one way to understand it is this. 
If we take a look at our samples, there are a lot of different ways to explain what's going on from a frequency perspective. One is a very simple function, which just interpolates from one to the next. Another is a function that oscillates one time. Another is a function that oscillates two times. I'm very bad at drawing, and so on. And that's what you're seeing here, that essentially there are many different ways to explain our samples here. One of them is some low frequency function that jumps right from one sample to the next. Another is maybe a slightly higher frequency function that has a dip in between those two samples, and so on. And so as we move farther and farther out, the basic point here is that there's no distinguishing between those different cases because between our samples, we don't have any information. Now, obviously, this is sort of a spiritual explanation. You guys should all go home and do lots of integrals to check that this is uh, what works out in practice. But essentially, the point here is that if I only have samples at the beginning and end of some interval, there are many frequencies that I could fit in between those two things that I wouldn't be able to see. Now, this diagram's a little bit messy. Here's another one. So here uh, we see an interval, like a function f of x, where I've just drawn two samples at 0 and 1, respectively, and shown all of the different ways that I could interpolate between these things with cosines and sines. And you can see that as we move down, these become higher and higher frequencies. Now, this is an artifact, typically, um, which is to say that when we undersample, maybe we're explaining things with low frequency, whereas really there's high frequency information. There are other cases where we might want to sample and actually just keep the high frequency information. This is kind of fun. So it turns out that computer graphics people aren't the only people that use these sorts of phenomena in different ways. So another great example um, is vibration of a string and audio. So uh, your instructor happens to be a cellist, so I have a lot of uh, personal experience with this kind of thing. So if you think of there being some giant cello sitting on top of this string here, right, there's your cello. <laughs> you know, maybe there's the neck, looks more like a viola da gamba or something. Then um, essentially when I pluck that string of my cello sitting right over there, all of these different vibrations happen all at one time, right? Because the ends of the strings are pinned, but beyond those two points, our string is allowed to freely uh, vibrate. In fact, one of the cool things that you can do on a string instrument is actually reveal these different vibration patterns. So for example, let's say that I place my finger very gently right at the middle of the string. Well, in effect, that says that I'm not going to allow this particular vibration because my finger got in the way. <laughs> or similarly here, I can't have this vibration, but I can have other ones that happen to have a node or a zero right where I put my finger. So what does this effectively do? It filters out the low frequency, right? This is the lowest frequency and just gives as a uh, result, the higher frequency information. And it turns out that musicians actually use this particular artifact. Um, so if you guys are ever bored and you dig through scores for violin or cello, um, you might see this really funny notation here. And essentially what this notation is telling you is that you clamp the string down at the bottom note, and then you gently place your finger at the top note so in effect, you're simulating this effect. You're gonna gently place your finger at this location uh, where I've drawn the arrow, and that prevents some of the low frequencies from playing. So what do you think happens when I do that? Well, I've filtered out the low frequencies. Those correspond to low pitches on a string instrument. And what I'm left with is the high frequency information. So let's uh, listen to what that sounds like. Hopefully this will go through on the uh, audio. Here's about to start. So I think we can all agree that, you know, even though, you know, violins are already kind of high pitched uh, squeaky instruments, 
the really high pitch that you're hearing in this uh, this Sarasate clip is due to this uh, this effect, sometimes called a false harmonic, where the violinist is in effect killing the the low frequency information, filtering it out, and just playing the high frequencies by very gently placing their finger on the string. Now, computer graphics people, we have the opposite problem, which is to say we confuse frequencies and they tend to be confused for low frequency information because that's what's left uh, when we record our samples. So how can we understand that from our Fourier perspective? Well, here's one way to do it. So remember that when we took the Fourier transform of our sampled function, we took the original Fourier transform and then we just repeated it a bunch of times to get all of these different repeats in the Fourier transform that then get summed together. Well, unfortunately, what ends up happening is something that we often call irrecoverable mixing. That is to say that the low frequency part of one piece gets summed together with maybe the high frequency part of some other piece, and they all get mixed together. So remember that we don't get to know where all these pieces came from. In our sampled function, we just have this one wiggly thing that we're trying to make sense out of. So in other words, we can confuse frequencies when they overlap. So now we're starting to get somewhere. We're starting to make some headway. Uh, in particular, we might ask, when do we not have this weird artifact? When do we not have irrecoverable mixing? Well, one case will be when we have something called a band limited function. So a band limited function is one, really wish my laptop wouldn't do that where essentially there is no frequency content outside of some region. So intuitively, what does that mean? That means that our function can't wiggle all that quickly <laughs> because all the high frequency wiggles just don't exist. That's our, our intuition here. This is a pretty boring, slowly moving function. Now, if you think for a second, sampling should do pretty well for functions that don't have too many high frequencies, right? Because those are the functions that you can sample and reconstruct with while well, being pretty confident that you didn't throw away any information in the process. Incidentally, one term that's worth knowing is bandwidth. You've probably heard this term before, but now you know what it means, which is that this is the maximum frequency uh, that's present in a uh, frequency limited signal. So, this, of course, is the frequency domain, and in the back of our heads, we should remember this is the Fourier transform of some really boring, slow-moving function. Right, so here's like x and f of x. I have no idea if this is actually the Fourier transform. This is just a uh, pictorial representation. So when we sample f of x, remember that corresponds to repeating the Fourier transform. But in this case, it repeats and there's no interference. That is to say that the tails of this function don't overlap. Remember that if we sample even more densely, these functions move farther and farther apart. That's what we already kind of figured out from before. So what does that mean? That means if we sample a band limited function in a dense enough fashion, we'll eventually get to a point where all the repeats are separated from one another and they don't get mixed together at all. There's no irrecoverable mixing. Now that sampling rate is sometimes known as the Nyquist rate. This is the lowest alias free sample rate. Fun fact, it's two times the bandwidth of a band limited signal. You can derive that by using some of the Fourier transform math that we've outlined before. So that's our sampling process. And essentially the point here is that if we sample a band limited function densely enough, then we actually didn't throw any information away. In fact, assuming we know the sample rate, we can actually recover the original function. Here's how we do it. We multiply it by the world's most uninteresting function. This is called the box function, which takes on the value one inside of the bandwidth and zero outside. So we have the Fourier transform of our sampled function and we just multiply it by something that zeroes out all of these sort of ghost frequencies that we don't expect to see. And this is a perfect reconstruction of our function. Now there's only one problem, but it's a serious one, which is that we did this in Fourier space. 
we should figure out what happened in the spatial domain. Now, here's a theorem that is very important mathematically. Again, sadly, in this short lecture, we can't cover it in detail. But one thing that you may know is that multiplication in the frequency domain is the same as convolution in the spatial domain. Now, convolution is like taking a function, dragging it across, multiplying and integrating each one. So it's like having a uh, replacing a function with a weighted average where the averaging weights are derived from the, uh, the second function that you're convolving against. The key theorem that is really important, this is the one part of our lecture that requires a bit of a leap of faith, is that multiplication in the frequency domain, so if I take two functions and I multiply them, that's the same in the spatial domain as convolving their Fourier transforms. So what does that mean? If we want to perfectly reconstruct our sampled function, we should convolve it against the Fourier transform of this box function. Remember that again, box is a function of xi, which is just one inside the bandwidth and zero outside. Because when we multiply box times this uh, Fourier transform of the sampled thing, what we get back is the Fourier transform of our original function. That's the point. Okay, and what is the Fourier transform of the box function? Well, it has a special name and that's sync. Roughly, this looks like cosine of x over x up to a few constants that I've probably forgotten. So it's a function that has a big wiggle in the center and then the height of the wiggles kind of die out as x goes away. And that actually completes our story. So let's summarize. We have some function f of x in the spatial domain. And in the frequency domain, we have some corresponding function Fourier transform of f, which is a function of frequency xi. And here's this pair. Now, the reality in graphics is that we work in the spatial domain, but we can keep our brains in the frequency domain just to understand the effects of what we're doing upstairs. So the first thing that we do in the spatial domain is we sample, hopefully at a rate that's above the Nyquist rate. What that does in the spatial domain is it replaces our function f of x with this impulse train that only knows the values of f at a finite set of points. And in the frequency domain, it takes the original Fourier transform of our band-limited function, and it repeats it a bunch of times. That's sampling. And now, if we want to reconstruct the function, downstairs, we want to get rid of all these spurious frequencies. So we multiply by the box function. And upstairs, that turns out to be the same as convolving against sync. So I take, it turns out, these samples, right? So if I think of these, as like x i and f of x i, we'll call that y i, then the best reconstruction that we can get kind of looks like f of x, probably going to get this slightly wrong, the sum over i of y i sync of x minus x i. That's it. That's our sampling and reconstruction picture. And when f is band limited, this reconstruction is actually perfect. Now, the reality is that this needs to be scaled by bandwidth and a bunch of other stuff that I've gotten wrong, but hopefully you get the idea. And in fact, in this whole procedure, we were able to sample and reconstruct and not lose any information. But here's our reality check. I mean, of course, somehow there would, be no and, uh, there would be no aliasing in the universe if we really believed that this story works. The reality is that practical signals can never have a finite bandwidth. This is really frightening and annoying. Um, if you're in physics, you may actually recognize this as the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It's also just a property of Fourier transform. Um, the, the main property is just that if you are band limited in the frequency domain, then you cannot be, um, have, you know, fit in a finite amount of space in the spatial domain and vice versa. And in fact, there's a lot of issues in the reality of this story. The second one is that sync as a function has a negative lobe. Um, so numerically, if you reconstruct things with sync, uh, oftentimes you'll end up accidentally introducing some negative values, which is not so good.
Of course, this particular uh, bug can be fixed by using a positive approximation, but suddenly you can see that we're starting not to follow that perfect, beautiful, harmonic picture we had before. Another issue is that sync has infinite extent, which means that we could end up with like order and squared algorithms for reconstructing our image, right? Somehow um, it's kind of amazing, right? That a sample all the way on my left of my image can actually re affect the reconstruction all the way on the right, just a tiny, tiny amount according to the sync function. Um, but what that means is that like coloring a pixel would require summing over the whole image, which isn't particularly practical. So typically we have to approximate. And the third issue, which is actually a really critical one and one that you often see totally ignored in graphics textbooks, is that this whole paradigm isn't really perfect. That um, We often assume that our functions are, not, are continuous, for example, or differentiable. Um, functions in graphics almost always contain sharp edges, uh, in which case this like throwing away high frequency information picture simply doesn't make sense. So anyway, the point of this little discussion was to get you guys to know the basic vocabulary words that people use when they talk about sampling, reconstruction, aliasing, and so on. The basic point here is that when we uh, are doing our rendering procedure, like doing ray tracing, we're effectively gathering samples, which is kind of like multiplying by an impulse train. And when we do our reconstruction, we can choose to light up our pixels in any way that we want. We don't have to just read off the color that we sampled. So, in fact, from a Fourier perspective, it may make sense to do a double sum over our image and actually use the sync function to reconstruct. The only problem is that this, this is a little bit of a fantastical story, uh, and the way that theory and practice meet can be quite challenging. So that includes our math discussion. Now, let's talk about what people do for anti-aliasing in practice. So it turns out that anti-aliasing in practice is a lot easier than anti-aliasing in theory, and that probably if I asked most of the students in this class to come up with ways to combat artifacts like the Jaggies, even if we didn't discuss Fourier at all, all of you would probably cook up some pretty reasonable strategies that are pretty close to what people do in practice, even if this uh, story involving you know sync and box functions is really the way to get the best possible reconstruction. So. In the ray tracing setup specifically, there's a very easy way to combat this jaggy artifact, which is essentially to compute multiple color values per pixel and average. The idea here being that if I think of my pixel like a box, which probably I shouldn't, you know, that contradicts what I said earlier in lecture, but bear with me for a moment, then if the uh, sphere cuts through this with some fractional way, and then I should somehow average the colors on the left with the colors on the right to get the final image. And so indeed, here's a very simple strategy called uniform supersampling, which all of you guys can and should implement at home, where what I'm going to do is rather than sending a single ray through the interior of my pixel, I'll send a k by k grid of rays. Here I guess k is equal to 3, and then average their colors. Notice that this is actually equivalent to rendering an image that's k times wider and k times taller and then shrinking it after the fact. These are, are exactly the same strategies. Now, the question is, I've gathered, in this case, these nine samples. Should I weight them all evenly? And this is where things can get a little bit funky. Like in particular, maybe I should give the pixel in this, or rather the sample in the center of this little square a higher weight uh, because somehow it's closer to the center of the pixel and that feels right. Alternatively, you know, this is a whole grid. Maybe the next pixel over also has nine samples and a tiny bit of a sample from the, the left pixel should actually go into the current one. Um, these things actually tend to be absolutely correct. So the choice of weighting when you do that weighted average is a really critical one. Um, and oftentimes people do this with some low pass filter. So the ideal one, as we've already discussed, is sync. Sync has a lot of drawbacks, um, namely that it goes off uh, infinitely wide. It's not perfectly aligned to reality uh, and it has some negative parts. Um, these are all big problems. Um, so a more typical weighting might be a Gaussian or a bell curve that's sort of centered at the middle of the pixel and drops off in a nice bell curve way, maybe with some finite extent to involve uh, so that we don't end up using a ton of computation. 
Um, and so this is really the, the basic trick. So um, this uh, super sampling idea, that's what this strategy is called, uh, appears in many different forms. By the way, a nice visualization people draw for those weightings is sometimes like a little cone sitting on top of the rendered image. Um, a different way to obtain the same thing would be to create a high resolution image with one sample per pixel, blur it out using some weighting, and then just keep the pixel centers. And there's many different filters out there that people use for these weights. Um, here's a very typical one. Uh, this is the bicubic piecewise polynomial approximation of sync. I think it's uh, sometimes the, the, the Mil Mitchell filter, but I'll, I'll let you guys find that online. Uh, and essentially what they've done here is taken that sync function, which is the ideal reconstruction uh, filter, but just keep one of the negative lobes. Um, so this way it has finite extent. You don't require a ton of computation to blur against this thing, but you still get a pretty good um, anti-aliasing effect. And very rarely do you introduce negative pixels because the, the negative lobe here is pretty small. So here's a comparison. So this image was rendered using the uh, box filter. And you can see if you look closely in the background that there's still some artifacts like moray patterns here that you probably wouldn't want in your rendered image. Now if I switch and I replace that with the cubic filter, you can see that this is a much better image. Again, so here's the box filter, here's cubic box, cubic, box, cubic. And you can see that, of course, we're not able to capture the high frequency detail. We only have so many pixels, but the reconstructed image really does look a lot better. So the strategy of sampling a uniform grid inside every pixel, it's called uniform super sampling, has a lot of advantages. It can capture high frequencies. The downsampling can use a nice, easy filter. Um, but that high frequency sampled image still has all the same aliasing problems, just pushed out to slightly higher frequencies. Um, and so this thing can fail. So one of the ways that it can fail is with uh, repetitive textures, where even the higher frequency samples still are subject to these moray patterns um, that, that can be problematic. So. One of the problems with uniform super sampling is that it essentially is just pushing aliasing farther out into the higher frequencies, but your signal is still not band limited and you still could have aliasing artifacts just in a different part of the uh, spectral domain. And this is particularly true if your sampling or your super sampling is regular, just these nicely evenly spaced samples, right? We keep returning to this little picture here where there's the ghost of a low frequency function hiding in a high frequency one. Now here's where we're gonna start making use of perception, which is to say we, at the end of the day, can only gather a finite number of samples. There's nothing we can do about that, but we can choose where to place them. Now, your eye tends to interpret noise by ignoring it, but it tends to interpret things that look like a signal by explaining them, right? So, you know, if you look at this set of red samples, you probably would interpret it as, you know, a nice low frequency function. And if that's meant as an approximation of this high frequency thing, probably a better or more desirable output might be just to have a little bit of noise or wiggliness rather than to see a pattern where there isn't one. So one strategy for achieving that is something called jittering. The idea of jittering is that I might have a grid of samples that I want to uh, gather, right? And these are spaced at a particularly carefully chosen spacing to make sure that uh, we capture high frequencies. But now rather than just gathering it at these plus signs, we're gonna perturb the position of our array a tiny random bit before we, uh, uh, before we do our ray tracing. So that's to say that we don't gather samples on a uniform grid, but rather one that's like randomly perturbed a little bit. Now, in this case, the signal processing gets a little more complex, like doing that weighted average is a little bit annoying because now these pixels aren't a predictable distance from one another but it can add noise where there used to be aliasing, which is actually a positive thing. We often think of noise as a bad thing, but here the noise is actually preferable to some low frequency weird artifact. So here we can see uh, some examples. So if we 
so here there's no jittering on the left and as we go to the right there's more and more jittering so what do we see by the way all of these images are low frequency because or low resolution because that's where these things are the biggest problem notice that there's some weird um, artifacts in our image like moray patterns that are due to undersampling that can occur even if we have like two samples per pixel but if we jitter even one sample per pixel you know it doesn't look perfect in the background right these are all green and red pixels but i think what you don't see is some crazy pattern hiding in the upper left that shouldn't be there <laughs> uh, and so actually uh, with the same amount of computation you can get a really nice effect now these issues can become more and more challenging so for example uh, here's another tricky case uh, which is in texture mapping so remember the Sampling issues can appear in texture mapping when I have, for example, a really detailed texture map that I view from far away. So one thing that we might ask is, you know, if a pixel takes up some finite extent in my final rendered image that corresponds to some region in my 3D scene, and I should try and average all the colors in that 3D region. So there's a lot of challenges when dealing with texture maps. For example, it's very rare that the screen space sampling density, in other words, the, the spacing between the pixels on your screen matches the sampling density of the texture, right? In fact, you can almost guarantee that, right? Like if I animate my hand moving farther and farther away from the camera, it might start out that the pixels on my hand texture are spaced pretty similarly to the space between the, space between the pixels on my screen. But then as I move my hand farther away, suddenly, you know, the space between the pixels on my screen stays the same, but these things bunch closer and closer together. And that process is called minification. So when you zoom in close to your texture, that process also can create artifacts that need uh, help. So here, these are actually high frequency artifacts in some sense, because you're seeing sharp edges. Uh, and that's magnification problem. Now for magnification, there's only so much you can do because there's just, you're trying to invent detail where there isn't any. One simple thing you could do is rather than having piecewise constant uh, data, you could linearly interpolate between your samples to get this smoothed out, but kind of blurry image. But the larger challenge is minification, right? Like here's a checkerboard texture. You can see this really terrible aliasing pattern that's shown up in the background. So when we minify textures uh, in uh, the texture mapping domain, essentially we're trying to remove these high frequencies that cause artifacts. In this case, when I say high frequency, the point is that we're like jamming lots of bricks into one pixel, right? So there's lots of white and red um, that, that are all getting combined. So what are we to do? Well, if we took our pixel grid and we kind of visualized it over the texture map, the pixel might kind of take a square shaped little area and essentially, the main trick that people use, it's called spatial filtering, is to integrate the color over the pixel. So maybe send out a lot of different samples or rays and average their color. This is kind of like taking the uh, texture and blurring it out, right? Essentially, there's this whole region in the texture that should get blurred before gathering just this one value at the center. So there's two strategies that we can do. We could either send out a bunch of rays and average their color like we've already talked about. But specifically for texture maps, one thing we could do is try to pre-filter, meaning that we're going to shrink the texture map so that one pixel in your shrunken texture map corresponds to many in the original, just kind of like going ahead and pre-computing that average uh, before you do your display. And that strategy, as we've already mentioned in an earlier lecture, is called MIP mapping. And the basic idea is that when we store a texture, we don't just store the high resolution texture, but we also store one that's half as wide, a quarter as wide, an eighth as wide, and so on. Now, initially, you might be concerned that this, this is gonna take up a lot of memory on your computer, but that turns out actually not to be the case. In particular, okay, so how much space does this thing take up relative to this thing? Well, it's half as wide, it's also half as tall. <laughs> uh, so this takes up one fourth of the memory that the uh, full thing does. This takes up one fourth of the one fourth. So this is like one sixteenth and so on. So the total amount of space it takes to store a MIP map is one plus one fourth plus one sixteenth 
plus so on powers of four this is a geometric series and i'm going to get it wrong but one thing i can tell you is that it's certainly upper bounded by two so within a constant factor of the amount of memory that you need um, you can store your mipmap so essentially what we're going to do is when we render we're going to choose a mip level that's what these things are called that corresponds to the density of pixels on your screen. It tries to equalize that with the density of pixels in your texture. So mip mapping is really nice because I don't have to send a lot of rays into a pixel, but I still can get an anti-aliased effect on the texture. That's gonna be really critical when we talk about rasterization and real-time graphics. So here's an example. So on the left-hand side, we did nearest neighbor filtering. So in other words, like a very high resolution texture. And when we render this image, we just grab one uh, value from the texture map. This is with one sample per pixel. We're not doing super sampling as, as an anti-aliasing strategy. And if we simply do mip mapping, meaning that each pixel chooses a rescaled value version of the texture so that the spacing between pixels in the rendered image is kind of similar to the spacing between pixels in the texture, then what you get is this nice smoothed out image on the right hand side. Now, unfortunately, this isn't a panacea. So here's an example um, with linear interpolation. This is starting to look pretty good, but there's still some artifacts in the background. You still see some weird uh, uh, feathering. Um, and here's the basic region, reason why. So far, when we've talked about taking this weighted average in our anti-aliasing procedure, we've thought about it kind of like a circle centered at our pixel, right? Like some nice Gaussian bell curve drop off from the center for our weighted average. But here's the problem. The MIP map is operating on the texture. It's not operating on the 3D uh, uh, image. So in particular, I might draw this nice circular um, filter on my computer screen, and that's what I should be using for my reconstruction. But that circular filter actually corresponds to some weird ellipse shape on the texture itself. And that's due to the fact that you don't just look at textures head on, they might be rotated away from your eye. So this is really tricky for a lot of different reasons. So for one, when you choose your MIP level, um, you might need to do a little bit of computation to kind of figure out, you know, how much does spacing on your computer screen correspond to spacing on the texture image? You can get that by differentiating the rendered uh, image or the depth in the, uh, the image. We'll talk more about how to obtain depth values. Uh, from ray tracing, it's pretty straightforward, but it turns out there's some pretty easy ways to do it in rasterization as well. And unfortunately, if you, even if you use some of these tricks, the MIP mapping actually doesn't look so great. <laughs> so here's an example on the right hand side and you can see some pretty terrible artifacts. And the reason for that is that every MIP map is just uniformly scaled, you know, by half width and half height. But in fact, this image is foreshortening more in one direction than it is in the other. So instead, there are many different techniques that try to account for that. So the basic one is the elliptical weighted average, which is kind of a combination of the last couple of things that we've talked about. So in the elliptical weighted average, you might store a MIP map, but then you're also going to do a little bit of super sampling. In particular, what you can do is try to figure out an ellipse on your textured image, which corresponds to a circle on your rendered image, and then maybe draw a few colors from your MIP map along the uh, principal axis of the ellipse and weight them together. So in other words, I'm gonna try and account for the fact that a circle on my computer screen looks like an ellipse in the rendered, uh, in, on the, along the texture. So here's a uh, comparison between the elliptical weighted average on the left and trilinear MIP mapping on the right. And you can see, especially in the background region that the elliptical weighted average looks much, much better. And this is essentially because it's accounting for the fact that there's foreshortening in one dimension more than the other. So anyway, this is mostly an advanced topic. These are just Googleable search terms that you can read about later. Um, they're fun things to implement and to think about. The basic point here is that anti-aliasing is really subtle <laughs> and it's hard to get right. Um, and people have put thoughts into the most minute of details of how to choose the color of a pixel. 
In fact, as one final example of that, um, a really critical example of anti-aliasing occurs when you're rendering fonts. Why? Well, fonts on your computer screen, each of the letters takes up a very small amount of space, so you really don't have that many pixels to work with. And fonts tend to contain, you know, ligatures and all of these little small markings that can be hard to capture on a pretty small pixel grid. So people do all kinds of tricks to improve aliasing in uh, font display. Um, and one of the really nice tricks that I think is one of my favorite ideas in the graphics universe, because it just combines everything we've talked about, uh, is even to use a trick called subpixel rendering. You might have seen that referred to on your computer as clear type. And the basic idea is that if you have knowledge of how your computer screen works, many computer screens are actually laid out, something like the uh, image in the middle here where you have this pattern of red, green, and blue pixels. Now, in everything we've done so far in 6837, we've stored red, green, and blue at the same locations, right? We just have one big grid of colors, and each pixel on our screen gets an R, a G, and a B value. But the reality is that if you can control those little circuits in your display, you can actually control the red, the green, and the blue pieces independently of one another. So. How do we get around uh, some of the frequency artifacts that we see in displaying fonts? Well, one way to reduce jaggies in fonts is to use subpixel rendering, meaning that you actually give a slightly different signal for red, green, and blue by accounting for the fact that they're slightly displaced from one another. And so you can see, for example, the comparison of these two lines. The clear type font is able to get much more detail, even if there's a slight color artifact because they're all misaligned from each other. So as a quick recap, I know we're out of time here. Sampling and reconstruction can both lead to aliasing. And aliasing is a problem. Why is it a problem? Well, for one, um, it's just frustrating that our computer screen only has so many pixels. But then with moray artifacts and other things, we actually see signal where there isn't any, right? Low frequency signal appears as aliasing that isn't in the original image that we were trying to produce. We developed a theoretical framework to explain this aliasing artifact and to talk about how we might choose a filter, at least in the ideal regime where our signal was band limited. And that magic filter is this function sync, which essentially ends up taking a weighted average of even far away samples based on a function that looks like cosine of x over x. But in reality, given the infinite extent and the negative values in sync, some more practical strategies like mip mapping and jittering can suffice even if they're not as backed by this beautiful theory. Now, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Now that people understand the basics of the Fourier theory of um, aliasing, sampling, and reconstruction, they often use that to inform really sophisticated display and reconstruction techniques that we won't have time to cover in 6837. This is a fun literature and one that links perception, mathematics, and a lot of other areas together. Um, and it links back to some of the signal processing roots uh, that we often see in the electrical engineering world. So I encourage you guys to dig into that some more. Unfortunately for us, our discussion of anti-aliasing is complete. So I'll see you next time.